I do live remote, and I do know about the people who hate me. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm on the verge of learning whether the whole thing was worth it or not. Um, because hey, it was. It was. Uh, in any day now, by and the decision has to get made by the 30th of June, the Minister of Fisheries is going to decide whether this whole salmon farming industry is going to get out and our wild fish can make it to sea again um, without breathing in all the pathogens. Um, and so it's a pivotal moment for me, but whatever happens, I've decided there were other things I wanted to do with my life than chase after people who were not being honest about what this industry was doing. And so I'm going to um, embark on that chapter on the 1st of July. Mm. But I never, I, I, it's so interesting getting a social awareness award because I went into the wilderness to figure out what whales were saying. I was one of those super awkward children mm -hmm. who never felt like she knew what she was supposed to do or wear. I still don't know what to wear. Um, and, but the animals looked so calm and they looked like they knew what was happening and, and where they fit in. And so I decided around the age of 12 that I, I wanted to learn to, I wanted to learn the language of one of the large brain animals on this planet other than us. And that was elephants, primates, or cetaceans, and I just kind of randomly pick cetaceans. And, but as a girl, I read all the books about people that went into the wilderness. And Jane Goodall's book was, was amazing to me because I thought as a child, you had to give the love of animals up. This was not an adult pursuit. My parents were considered space philosophers which is kind of a small category of people. <laughs> but, so I thought I needed to study the planets and I tried really hard not to look under the sticks and rocks and you know where the, where the snakes and, and frogs were and all the rest of it. But then I saw Jane Goodall on the cover of National Geographic and um, it was a moment in time that just everything went silent as in my mom's study and I just sank to the floor and I just stared at this woman in the woods. I was like, oh, so is this a setup? <laughs> you know, was, where is this? And started to read through it and yeah, she was actually there. And it just, it opened the door to me. And so I read all the books about people that went into the wilderness and studied animals. And I noticed every single book was in three parts. Part one was, oh wow, everything. Uh, the adventure, the danger, learning the secrets of an animal is just so remarkable and, and rewarding because it's not easy. I've spent a lot of time where you can see them, near them, following them. Um, part two of every single book was basically, oh shit, <laughs> this is all about to end. And part three was just super boring. It was about trying to talk to government, students moving into your space because they had all the energy to you know carry on all the very aspects of work that we knew needed to be done and so I was all determined I was not going to do part two and three I was just going to stay right in part one and I went off <laughs> armed with that and but what I didn't realize is I was in the same environment as the whales that I was studying in this remote float house community of Echo Bay and you can't separate yourself from that. And I, I love it when um, I have a, a lot to do, but I think that that is going to solve the problem. Whether it's like, I love homesteading, I love building, I love gardening, I love, you know, physical, hard physical work, but I also, um, you know, loved the whole challenge of, of trying to figure out what the whales were talking about. And when the fish farm thing happened, I was like, okay, I got this. I, I got this handled. I'm just going to figure this whole thing out. I'm going to write up a report for the government. And, you know. 
But what I failed to understand was that I should have reached out to people, that it was about social awareness. I should have built the relationships much earlier with the First Nations whose territory I was in, with the chiefs and the elders and the fishermen. I should have understood a little bit more about politicians and what they care about and all the rest of it. So I basically stumbled along for three decades, uh, like going down dead ends. And so I'd get to a dead end, and at least, at least I did recognize I was at a dead end, and I would try something different. And so I did letters. I wrote 10,000 pages of letters in Echo Bay. So I'm living in a float house, and I would start up the generator and have the little um, printer. The postmaster said I kept the post office open. <laughs> so that there was some good to that, because we got our mail by seaplane three times a week. And then, uh, and then I turned my home into a research station, and I invited all these scientists when I discovered the sea lice problem, because by then I knew the government wasn't going to just listen to me. And they were fabulous. Um, but eventually I moved out because they were just everywhere uh, in one place. But that didn't work. And so then I turned to activism, which is really exciting, really harsh. Um, I feel very protective now about other activists. I think, um, I think it has to be a lot more kindness um, uh, between us and to them, like to the younger activists I see now. But that didn't work either. And what worked in the end was relationship with First Nations. And uh, what I've been able to observe over the last few years is that these, these First Nation governments, which I just wasn't really interested in people at all, but they're reconstituting from destruction and loss and cutting of all kinds of lines in their ancestry and in their government and in their legends, everything. But they're reconstituting and their government grew here uh, in the wilderness and therefore understands the natural laws, obeys the natural laws, um, holds them as being the law. And I realized, okay, so that's how humans fit into a place. Today, I interestingly realized that there's this new form of science that is allowing salmon to talk to us. It's a genomic science that reads our immune system. And I don't do this science, but I stumbled on it in these documents in the Cohen Commission in 2010. And I was like, oh my god, OK, this is how we're going to turn the fish back on. Um, nobody knew about the science. Science is suppressed within DFO. And so then that became my role, is trying to bring forward how the fish can talk to us and become our guides in um, what we're doing wrong on this coast. And so you just take a tiny little clip of their gill, and you read the switches that are turned on and off in their immune system. And if you do that along their migration route, you can see exactly where their immune system lights up. And it will tell you heat stress, pathogens, <coughs> viruses, pollutants. It's like a report card on us. And so going forward, this is going to be part of my work, is to really um, communicate that we now can learn from the salmon. We can learn how to become a better animal, learn how to fit into this planet, learn how not to destroy everything around us. And it's, uh, it's been such a long slog because basically I've been running around after three-year-olds in adult bodies. <laughs> um, Canada has this incredible uh, Access to Information Act, and you can actually go on a website, and for $5, you can order the conversation between two government employees, or however many you want, and how you shape your request. You might get 50,000 pages, or you might get three, um, but you're actually hearing from them. And so I just got three more yesterday, and you know I just read these things, and 
I'm angry. Uh, I feel betrayed. And I realize, you know, from the very beginning, that if I give in to that anger, everybody in this room and in the world has an off switch for women who go shrill. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, and so you have to just like breathe in and just like, okay, what is the goal here? What is the goal here? Who can I give this information to? How can I deal with this? How can I fix this? How can I make this better? This was the mantra every single day. You know, where's the path? And um, today, I'm very fortunate that there's this whole fabulous group of young scientists that went through my research station who grew up under the abuse of Fisheries and Oceans Canada and are willing to speak the truth and um, carry on the investigation into how we can look at these fish and what are, where, where we fit in on, on this coast. And so I'm now in this interesting position. It's fabulous when you get older because you just really don't care what people think about you nearly as much. You guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, you're not Jones and Farrow job, or you know, you're not. There's a lot of things you're not doing, um, and so you can be very clear about it. And so that's what I'm trying to do with government. I'm trying to see the good that they're doing. I'm trying to support our minister Joyce Murray, who is dealing with a really aggressive industry. Um, I mean, at one point, this industry hired boats with blacked-out windows to follow me around. And I had no idea what the plan was. Like, is this only happening on the water? Are you guys following me around on land too? What, you know, what do you want to do with this? And so I can only imagine she's getting it many, many times worse. Um, but I'm also less forgiving. I'm grumpier. I have grandchildren who I'm going to go see tomorrow for the first time in two and a half years. So. This event helped me get closer to them because I was reluctant to leave the North. Um, and I really want them to have a world that is alive and, and is good for them. So when you give me an award like this, it's, it's helpful personally, of course, and I appreciate it. And you're right, for some reason we, we dwell on the anger and um, my friend Sue here handles my social media and she knows more about it than me. Um, but um, it's important to, to get the acknowledgement of an award like this because I want the power to do good. I want the power to make the changes we need to make. Because as I wrote to the minister, our governments need to start make, making decisions that are based not on what a corporation wants and all the lawyers and all the lobbyists and international trade and economics and all the rest of it. Of course, all of that is important. But they have to start representing and making decisions on the things that nobody owns. The clean air, the clean water, the, the, these fish that all of us, none of us own. They, they need to change the way they make decisions. And so when you give me this, you give me a little bit more power to, to, to do that good, to make those changes. And in closing, this might sound arrogant or overblown, but I want everybody to know that you individually have become as important as the rain and the winds and the tides, and the mountains. We are so big on this planet. There are so many of us now. That nothing really functions without our love and protection and goodwill towards that species and our knowledge of what they need and our understanding. We are highly relevant for bad reasons and good. But we are as important as everything you see out there beyond the buildings, but the natural forces. You know, when I look out from my home 
I look down the spine of Vancouver Island and I can see the ocean moisture coming in and it hits those mountains and it rears up over them and then it dumps water into the watersheds and then those watersheds produce salmon and then the salmon go out into the ocean and they collect the energy of the sun hitting the open ocean and then they come back and when they die they release that energy and it pours down over the mountains and it feeds the trees that make the oxygen we breathe and pulling this deadly carbon out of the atmosphere. And we decide whether that works or not. And with this very powerful science, we can figure out how not to break it, but to dovetail into it and, and work with it. And um, So it always comes down to language, doesn't it? You have to explain these things. You have to make people feel powerful. And I really appreciate your remarks um, because I had no idea what depression was. I always thought I was completely resistant to it, but none of us are in the end. And um, it's, 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 it's good to know it's also a big responsibility when people are thrilled to meet you and say, you know, you give me hope, and then you're like, oh. <laughs> I, hope, I hope I am doing something good here. So um, think of me when you hear the decision. Could be tomorrow, uh, before the 30th. Are our salmon going to swim to sea unharmed? Are we going to give them safe passage through these waters of British Columbia or not? So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It is a huge responsibility to take into the future trying to carry forward this change that we all know so know so deeply needs to happen now. I think there over the past 30 years it's taken a while to get um, to get everyone understanding what needs to happen and it's just uh, it is because of voices like yours that have raised that, that have raised these issues and, and there's no question that we all understand. Yeah, so I hope that uh, that we can carry this forward, each of us in this room in our own way and, and uh, with your words. So thank you so much for all of you being here tonight. I'd like to again acknowledge Alan for um, NBC Book World for the creation of these awards and the support over the years. Beverly Graham. And Beverly, Alan. yeah. And Beverly, who <laughs> is, that was coming, don't worry. And, and Beverly, who is, has been pivotal in organizing this evening and bringing us all together here. I, I'd like to, to thank you for gathering in this room that I think I want to recognize you as a boss for his support in this room, the Poet Laureate's Corner at VPL and for his support of the library over the years, along with this award. I hope you'll take a moment to, um, to recognize the poets that are, uh, that are named in the garden here for the city of Vancouver over the years. And, uh, and so one last time to thank, uh, to thank all of you for being here tonight. Uh, I'd like to recognize the, the, vo the power of voices raised together that I really see in what we've been talking about this evening and the work of both of you, whether that is the power of voices raised together as workers united in unions, which um, are such an important part of BPL and of the city of Vancouver, um, or it's the voices raised together to change the environment and protect the, the living world and take us into the future. So thank you so much, Tom and Alexandra, and I hope that you all take some time to mingle with each other, whether that's inside or um, enjoying the rather chilly uh, <laughs> garden this evening. Thank you for being here. Thank you.